morning. And now we turn our attention to his word in preaching. Luke chapter 23 is where we are this morning. Luke chapter 23. We return to a text that we began to examine last Sunday morning and evening. We continue this morning, Luke 23, beginning at verse 50. We read down to verse 56. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. One of the great themes of the Word of God is the theme of God's faithfulness. Uh, Many times the Bible states the fact that God is faithful, but all over the Bible, God's faithfulness is demonstrated. It's put on display, the faithfulness of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, in the context of of the Lord finishing this this work of salvation that he's accomplished in our lives, sustaining us to the end, presenting us before himself guiltless. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where our security is found. That's where our assurance is known. Not in ourselves, but in God and his faithfulness. God is faithful. He will finish that which he has begun. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, God communicating to the nation of Israel the fact that he had chosen them out of all the nations of the earth. He has this special relationship with them and he's explaining why he chose them, not based upon anything lovely in them, but based upon his own love. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9, the Bible says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. To a thousand generations. In other words, without end, you see the faithfulness of God. What is being affirmed about God when the Bible says that he's faithful? When I say to you this morning that God is faithful, what is affirmed in that statement? Well, the faithfulness of God has to do with his words. We're saying that God is truthful, absolutely truthful, perfectly truthful, always truthful. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is tested. Every word of God is trustworthy. It's impossible for God to lie What he says is true, but it also affirms the trustworthiness of God beyond just his words. I mean, it's possible for someone to speak true words but not have the ability, the capacity to fulfill what they say, to perform what they say. God is able, isn't he? He performs his word. Everything that he says, he performs. So he is trustworthy in terms of what he does, in terms of his character and what he does, as well as what he says. To say that God is faithful is to affirm the immutability of God. He does not change. Numbers 23, 19, God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. 
Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? So what he says he does and he doesn't change and he's able to perform what he says. To say that God is faithful is to affirm the perfect knowledge of God. He knows everything about that which he speaks. He knows all of the details that are taken into account when he promises something and he looks to the details. He, do, he never forgets the details. It affirms the loving concern of God. What is the motive that stands behind the promises that God makes to his people? But that he's chosen to love us and he never stops loving us. His love for us is unbreakable. His concern for us is constant. When we say that God is faithful, it means that his attitude toward us doesn't change. It affirms the sovereign rule of God. He executes all his decrees. He rules over everything. I love the one line of the song that we sang this morning, that the wind and the sea, they, they, they haven't forgotten the voice of the one who ruled them when he was here on earth. They still respond to his voice. He's sovereign over everything. Well, when we come to these verses, we see the faithfulness of God on display. Uh, we've Last week and this week, we're thinking about why the burial of Christ matters. Why is it that God gave us so much detail about the burial of his son? We understand the details regarding the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, but why all of these details about the burial of Jesus? And last Sunday, we said that the burial of Christ speaks of the reality of his death, and we talked about heresies that are destroyed when you realize the reality of the death of Christ and lying theories that would seek to, to, to uh, deny the resurrection, these theories are blown up and destroyed when you see that re Jesus really did die. So the burial details let us know of the reality of the death of Christ. And then we talked about the reward of his death. Jesus died to save his people from their sins, to, to save them for God, to save a people for God. And on display in these accounts about the burial of Jesus, you see salvation at work. You see a man like Joseph. You see these women who followed him all the way from Galilee. Their, their faith is not yet perfected, but it's real. You see real faith on display as Joseph's faith emerges from the shadows, whereas once he was afraid to be clearly identified with Jesus, he now steps out of the shadows into the light, clearly identifies himself with Christ. And these women display their love for Jesus even though they don't, they haven't really taken into their hearts what he has said about his resurrection. His enemies have re remembered more about his resurrection than his disciples have. It's an amazing thing. His enemies are afraid that someone's going to come and steal the body and then the words of Jesus about his resurrection will be, be believed to be true. And his disciples have completely forgotten about his promise of resurrection. And so their, their faith is not perfected, but it's real. It's real faith. And so on display in these details is the reward for which Jesus died, a people saved by him. But now this morning we, we see two additional things that, Im, that, that are on display through these burial details. The third of which, where we begin this morning, is this. The, the burial of Jesus demonstrates the reliability of God's word. The reality of his death, the reward of his death, and now the reliability of God's word. The faithfulness of God in terms of his word one of the great evidences of the divine authorship of Scripture is the fulfillment of predictive prophecy. When the Bible says that something is going to take place, in some cases ages, before it actually occurs, and then when it comes to pass in minute detail, it reveals the fact that the Bible really is the Word of God. That the Bible proclaims the decrees of God, that the Bible reflects the eternal knowledge and wisdom of Almighty God. He knows the end from the beginning because, you see, he dictates the end from the beginning. 
He's sovereign over all things. And when he tells us in advance what he's going to do in his word, and then later on it comes to pass exactly like he said it would be, now we know that what we're reading, what we have, what God has given to us is in fact his word. Many of the prophecies found in the Old Testament were messianic prophecies. God telling his people in advance what would be true of the Messiah so that when he arrived they could recognize him. The Apostle Peter wrote about this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, he writes this, Though you have not seen him, speaking of Jesus, though you have not seen him, you love him. That's our testimony, isn't it? We haven't seen him, but do you love him this morning? So we haven't, do you love him this morning? So we haven't seen him, but we love him, right? Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ, and the subsequent glories. Let me just stop there. You get the picture. These prophets are giving, God God is giving through them his word, and they are are sensing, as they they are his messengers, they are sensing that God is giving things that don't belong to their own time, but to a future time, things about the Messiah, things about his suffering, things about glory, and they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure this out. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were, they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So over time, these prophets became aware of something. What we're being given here is predictive. What we're being given is future. It doesn't belong to our age. It belongs to a future age. And Peter says, now you have seen those things predicted through them come to pass. These are the things now we announce to you and preach to you, things spoken of from of old, but now these things have come to pass. So that... You should know what God was giving through them was, in fact, his word. Well, this account of Christ's burial represents a case of biblical prophecy being fulfilled. And thus, it speaks to us of the reliability of the word of God. Why are we given these details about Joseph of Arimathea? Why tell us that he asked for the body of Jesus, that it was placed in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock? Why tell us it was his tomb? Why in the other gospel accounts are we told that he was, Joseph was a rich man, which we could have already just assumed from the fact that he has this tomb hewn out of the rock? Why tell us that he's a rich man? Why do these details matter? Because over 600 years before it happened, God told us in his word that the Messiah would suffer on behalf of sinners, that he he would be numbered with transgressors, but that in his death, he would be with a rich man. I mean, what what might seem like just a, a small detail to us is in fact proof that Jesus was and is the Messiah. God gave this detail over 600 years before it occurred. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, listen to it. By oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living stricken for the transgression of my people and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his 
hand. And here is Jesus, numbered with transgressors as he goes to the grave, but he is with a rich man in his death, in his burial. This is why Matthew is careful to add the note in Matthew 27, 57. When it was evening, there, were, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. Matthew 27, verse 60, and laid it, the body of Jesus, in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. So the word of God said that it would be And now the word of God tells us that it was. The Messiah will be with a rich man in his death. Now Luke tells us, Matthew tells us, Mark tells us he was indeed with a rich man in his death. He's buried in this rich man's tomb. God's word perfectly fulfilled. Even to the smallest details. And stop and realize how God performs his word in so many of these cases. He performs his word through providence. And in many ways, that's more miraculous than God working through miracles. Right, a miracle, God interrupts, you know, what is natural, the natural order. He sort of steps in and breaks up what is natural to do something that is so clearly supernatural, miraculous, right? But when God works through providence, he's working through ways that are amazingly natural. Yet his will is being performed. So for this particular prophecy, given over 600 years before it took place, for it to be fulfilled, understand what had to happen. There had to be a rich man, who happened to be a member of the Sanhedrin, who had it in his heart to give Jesus his own tomb. And how did God bring that to pass? But he saved this man, Joseph, from Arimathea. This man was a disciple of Jesus. He gives this man life, everlasting life. And as a result, he finds it in his heart out of love for Jesus. He finds it in his heart to give Jesus his own new tomb. And thus, the word of God was fulfilled. For this to take place, there had to be a pagan Roman governor named Pilate who was willing to grant Joseph's desire. He was in no no way obligated to do it. I told you last week, these criminals were often cast into common graves. So he, he didn't owe Joseph, or anyone else for that matter, the right to give a, an honorable burial to Jesus. But when Joseph comes and asks for the body of Jesus, God is at work in this pagan man's heart, granting him the desire to turn the body over to Joseph so that God's word would be perfectly fulfilled. You know, it's not, it's not a ray of light coming from heaven that bursts open a tomb in the midst of the rock where a, you know, on, on a piece of property that a rich man owned. No, it's God working through his providence in the hearts of men so that they fulfill the words of God. It's amazing. And by the way, when I think about Pilate and him having the desire to grant the body of Jesus to Joseph and Thus, God's word being fulfilled. I just want to remind us, you know, in these crazy times in which we're living, I want to remind us and encourage us with the thought that we are not at the mercy of earthly rulers. Our president is not sovereign, nor is any other earthly ruler before him or after him. The only one who's sovereign is our God. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. The king's heart is subject to sovereign God. And God can turn that heart in whatever direction he wants to, whenever he wants to. So that what we have in the burial details of Jesus is proof Just another proof, just an additional proof of the reliability of the Word of God, the absolute faithfulness of the Scriptures. So let me ask you a question. Let me just stop there and bring it home to us for a moment. Are you convinced of that? Are you? And I I want you just to draw a circle around you for a moment. 
Not your husband, not your wife, not your kids, not your friends, not anyone else sitting around you, just you. I want to ask you, are you convinced of the reliability of the Scriptures? Is the Word of God true? Are you, for example, are you convinced that all the Bible's warnings are to be heeded. When the Bible warns you, do you listen? When the Bible says this is sin and it's going to destroy you, does that mean anything to you? When the Word of God tells us that the wrath of God is is coming. The world is currently under the wrath of God, if not in Christ. You're under the wrath of God, and then there's an everlasting wrath to be faced for all those who die without Jesus. Do you, do you hear that? Do you believe that? Do you know that to be the truth? Isn't it true that men and women, for the most part, and in some cases even saved people, we live our lives every day with very little thought about the fact that we are one breath away, one heart functioning properly, you know, stopping away from eternity. If you die today, what happens? By the way, even though you may want to shove it out of your mind, you do know you will die if Jesus doesn't come in your lifetime, right? You will die. So what happens? Some would say, well, we just cease to exist. That's it. And if that's it, well, then eat, drink, and be merry because it may happen tomorrow. Get all you can get. Hold on to it with all your strength. Claw for it because this is it. Some people would imagine, well, here's what happens. We all go to a better place. That's the average funeral service, isn't it? doesn't matter who the person was, how they lived, what they believed. We all go to a better place. Well, I know he's in a better place. Maybe that's the case, right? That we all go to a better place. Maybe it's some ethereal place where we float around and you know, who knows what. But it's just a better place. Or maybe, maybe some would say, you know, what happens is you just get another, you get another chance. You get another life. Just recycle this thing. You come back. You're somebody else. You were somebody years ago. You can't remember it, but and now you're you, and then one day you'll be somebody else. Or maybe it's what the Bible says. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. And the Bible says, he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So that it's Jesus or wrath. It's Christ having saved me or it's an everlasting judgment. And the moment I die, I'm either with the Lord if I know Jesus, if I've known Jesus, if I've trusted in Christ, I'm with the Lord in death or I'm immediately, immediately in a place of everlasting torment. Is that the truth? Because if the Bible is true, that's the truth. And if that's the truth, then there's nothing more important in this world than what your relationship is to Jesus. Nothing more important. Do you really believe the Bible? Do you really believe the Bible? Are you living like it today? Are you convinced that all the Bible's promises are to be counted on? Not, all of its, not only all of its warnings, but all of its promises. Do you live your life in light of the promises of God? what he promises to his people, what he, he says he's doing and what he means to do and what he will do. Do you count on those things? Do you live in the light of them? Are you convinced that all the Bible's predictions are certain to be fulfilled? Do you believe God when he tells you about the future? The future of this world? The future eternity that is to come? Christ ruling and reigning on the earth? All the enemies of Christ cast into an everlasting judgment. Do you, do you think these things are coming? Is the Bible what it says it is? Does it do what it says it does? 
Is it therefore to be believed, obeyed, and treasured the way that it says it ought to be believed, obeyed, and treasured? Do you believe its testimony to Jesus? Is Jesus who the Bible says that he is? Did he do what the Bible says he did? When we see statements made hundreds of years before they occur, and then we see those statements perfectly fulfilled in time and history, what does it say? It says that God's word is reliable, it is faithful, it is true, and the wisest thing you will ever do as an individual is stake your life on the words of God. And the burial of Jesus demonstrates it. He will be with a rich man in his death, and indeed he was. Well, there's a fourth thing I want to point out from these verses in terms of what the burial of Jesus demonstrates. The reality of his death, the reward of his death, the reliability of God's word. Fourth, the burial of Jesus demonstrates the faithfulness of God's love. Not just the faithfulness of his word, but now the faithfulness of his love. You'll remember how earlier Luke allows us to see Jesus through the eyes of Psalm 31. Luke is the only one who tells us that out of the mouth of Jesus, this is back up in verse 46, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Into your hands I commit my spirit. That's Psalm 31 verse 5. And as Jesus had done earlier in his life in, in that synagogue in Nazareth, he only quotes the part of the verse that actually applies to what he's doing. Psalm 31 verse 5 reads this way, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Well, Jesus was not redeemed. Jesus, he's the redeemer. He's the savior. He doesn't quote that part. He quotes this part, Into your hand I commit my spirit. I give myself into your care. And Psalm 31, as I told you when we were there, it's a psalm about the vindication of the righteous sufferer. You have the one who is righteous and he's suffering and he entrusts his vindication to God. God, you're the one who will vindicate me. Psalm 31 verse 18 said, Let the lying lips be mute, which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. God, shut their mouths. Those who speak against the righteous, close their mouths. And here is Jesus entrusting himself. He's, he's, he's dying. He is now yielding up his life. And he says, Father, it's into your hand that I give myself. I entrust myself to you. What, what happens beyond this is in your hand. Well, we know that the ultimate vindication of Jesus is going to occur three days later when he's raised from the dead. In the tomb on Friday, remains there on Saturday, raised from the dead early on Sunday. There he will be vindicated, the resurrection. But isn't it interesting that God the Father is already giving us tokens of the vindication of his Son right here? Because despite the fact that Jesus has been numbered with transgressors, he's going to be honored in his burial. The father's love for his son, the father's faithfulness to his son, the father's vindication of his son is going to be put on display right away as he is honored as a king in his burial. Robert Stein said this, he said, even as only a virgin cult was worthy for the king of Israel as he entered into Jerusalem, so only a virgin tomb was worthy for the burial of the king of the Jews. Not only is he with a rich man in his death, but the tomb has never been used before. It's known no decay in its presence. Worthy of a king. 
John Nolan said this, while in and around Jerusalem there are still today the remains of many tombs hewn out of the rock, such a burial arrangement is likely to have fit the socioeconomic standing of Joseph rather better than that of Jesus himself. Jesus is being dignified in death in a way that he had not been in life. The mention that the tomb had not been previously used is also concerned with the appropriate honoring of the Lord. Daryl Bach writes this, Luke 23, 53, 56, shows the care that Jesus' body receives. Jesus dies as a criminal, but is buried in honor. Joseph is a faithful disciple who honors his Lord. He asks for Jesus' body, donates a new tomb as a resting place, and cares for the body as the law prescribed. Others also will honor the Lord. The women prepare to anoint the body with spices on Sunday, but on the Sabbath they honor the law by resting. Those who follow Jesus are pious people who serve God faithfully. The reader is to note the respect shown to Jesus and the effort made to give him care. Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. Now, who will see to it how the body of Jesus is to be cared for? The Father sees to it as to how the body of his Son will be cared for, and his Son's body is cared for with honor. Psalm 31, the righteous sufferer trusts God to vindicate him. Luke chapter 23, the father is already vindicating his son. And we know that vindication goes beyond his burial, gets to the resurrection itself. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 25, in the midst of that great sermon, this is said, for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he's at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. Listen to this. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Did you hear that? You won't let it happen. You won't let it happen. God, you will not abandon my soul to Hades. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And then Peter says this, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw... And spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. God didn't allow it. God didn't allow the dishonoring of his son's body. God did not allow his son's body to see corruption. God raised him from the dead and thus vindicated him. What is this? This is the faithfulness of God. Not only the faithfulness of his word, but the faithfulness of his commitment to his son. The faithfulness of his love to his son. And do you realize that speaks to us of God's faithfulness to his people. God's faithfulness to all of us who are in his son, who are accounted before God in his son. I like what Martin Luther said. He said, as he has no tomb, for the reason that he will not remain in death and the tomb, right, he didn't need his own, As he has no tomb for the reason that he will not remain in death and the tomb, so we too are to be raised up from the tomb at the last day through his resurrection and are to live with him in eternity. You see, you've been promised resurrection too, haven't you? Hasn't God spoken of the resurrection of his people? Are you convinced of that? Are you convinced of the faithfulness of God's love to you in Christ? 
Isn't it interesting in Romans chapter 8, as Paul makes that powerful, great argument for the purpose of our assurance, isn't it interesting? He ties it to the love of God in Jesus Christ. Not just the truthfulness of God, but the love of God. Romans 8.35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Why can you be confident today if you're a child of God? Why can, why can your life be full of peace? Because Jesus loves you, and he'll never stop. God's word is faithful, and so is his love. But you know what? Whether we believe that or not is tested every day. I mean, the degree to which we believe that, as we talked about last week, thank God, perfect faith is not, is not the grounds of assurance because we don't have it, do we? And every day what's being put on display is whether or not we really understand how reliable God's word is and how faithful God's love is. What does your life say about your understanding of that? Our belief in the faithfulness of God's word is tested and proven every day. By this, how do you think? How do you feel? What do you do? Do your thoughts agree with Scripture? Do your attitudes agree with Scripture? Do your choices agree with Scripture? You know, one of the hardest things we have as pastors is trying to teach people not to think emotionally, but to think biblically. And not to think in terms of their senses, but to think in terms of the Scriptures. Well, this is what I feel, and this is what I think, and this is what I think I need, and this is what I think, and this is what I think, and this is what I feel. Listen, what does God say? What does he say? Uh, we find out every day what we really believe about the reliability of God's word because we think in terms of it, we feel in terms of it, we choose in terms of it, or we don't. Do you believe the word of God is faithful? Is it the safest place to walk? but also tested is our belief in God's love for us. Because many of the poor choices we make are tied to our doubting God's commitments to care for us the way he's promised to care for us. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Then he asks this question, are you not of more value than they? Do you think God doesn't care about you more than he does birds? Takes care of them, will he not take care of you? Sometimes we doubt God's care for us because God knows it's best for us that his care for us comes to us through means that are difficult for us. Do you hear what I just said? See, we think God caring for me means he's going to give it to me on a platter. <laughs> no, sometimes he gives it to me through very hard circumstances. But he walks us through those hard circumstances because he knows the best thing for us is not our ease, but likeness to his son. And the difficult circumstances are used by God to make us more like His Son. So He does provide for us just in ways that we would not have chosen. Do we believe He loves us? Matthew 6, verse 30, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you? And then what does He say? Oh, you of little what? Faith. You don't have much faith. Faith in what? Faith in God's word. Faith in whom? Faith in God himself. Faith in the faithfulness of his love. 
in these burial details, Jesus really died. We see saved people. The reward of his death is already on display. We see the fulfillment of God's word from ages past down to the smallest detail. His word is faithful, and we see God care for the body of his son through natural, what seems like natural means through providence. God takes care of his son and puts on display the faithfulness of his love, and all of these things apply to everyone sitting in this room right now, everyone who knows Jesus. question is, do you believe these things? And may God strengthen his people this morning to believe in his word and to trust in his love. And in that way, walk in the safety that is the will of God that has been revealed, the revealed will of God. If you don't know Jesus, I invite you into the love of God this morning through faith in God's loving Son. Jesus died for sinners. If you know yourself to be a sinner in need of great forgiveness, unimaginable forgiveness, then I have good news for you. Jesus died for sinners. Turn from your way, trust in God's Son, and you will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise for great is your faithfulness. Perfect is your faithfulness. All your words are true. Your love toward us is amazing. It goes beyond our capacity to understand or to grasp or to appreciate. And you never change. So what is left for us is to bow and to say thank you and to rest in the grace and the love and the peace and the joy that is found in your Son. These things are too high for us, too wonderful for us. We rest in these things. And we pray for anyone hearing my voice who is outside of Christ. Oh Lord, save them today. Let them know a heart that's willing to turn from sin to the Savior. Let them know a heart that would desire you more than life itself. Grant them a heart that believes the gospel. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.